Hello and welcome to Your Planet, Your Questions. I'm Professor Brian Cox. I'm the Royal Society Professor for Public Engagement in Science. And it is wonderful. I think we're all delighted to see how many of you, both young people and teachers, submitted questions to the Great Science Share for Schools campaign this year. It's been very, very difficult to select your questions. Um, and so we've tried as hard as we can to cover all the subjects that you're interested in. Now I'm joined today by three world experts on our planet and climate, Dr. Emily Schuckberg, Dr. Lindsay Turnbull, and Dr. Mark Richards. And they will have the difficult and wonderful task of answering as many of your questions as we can fit in. Now I'm going to ask the panel to introduce themselves. I've already given you the names, but I'll give you a bit of background as to who they are and what they do. So I'm, uh, I'm Emily and I'm a climate scientist. I've spent most of my career studying the polar regions. So I've had the amazing privilege of spending time in the Arctic up with the polar bears in the north and down in the Antarctic with the penguins um, in, the, in the south. Um, now I run the Cambridge Zero initiative at the University of Cambridge, which is not just about understanding how our climate is changing, but also how we can respond to it using both technology and nature and human behaviour is part of the change. Hello, so my name is Lindsay and I am in charge of the biology teaching here at Oxford University. And that means I get to work with a lot of young people. They're not quite as young as you all are, but they're also very concerned about the climate and about the planet. And I interact with them all the time. Uh, and from a scientific background, I'm what's called an ecologist. And an ecologist is someone who studies plants and animals in their natural environments. And actually the biggest thing that I study are plants, which I know young people often don't think about quite so much because they haven't got eyes and they're not as cute as polar bears and penguins, but plants are still very important for our planet. Hello, and I'm Mark. I'm an atmospheric physicist at Imperial College London and I was actually an undergraduate chemist and I was always interested in the environment and in pollution generally. Uh, it started off with water pollution and then into pollutants in the air and I was always fascinated by how we could detect them. And so um, at the moment I, I currently do a lot of engagement work, outreach work, as well as uh, look at uh, urban air pollution and how that uh, affects our health and also the ecology, the climate and the ecology. Uh, so I'm really looking forward to answering some of your meaty questions. Well, thank you all. Um, we, we've noticed that your questions fell into uh, six main themed areas. And so we're going to cover those one at a time. And the first one, I suppose, not surprisingly, is where it all began. So when did scientists or when did we first realise that there is a problem with the climate? We received lots of questions on this topic. And we're going to hear from two young people, Noah and Layla, who've asked questions that actually many of you asked. Hi, Professor Brian Cox. My name's Noah from English Matters, and my question is, at what time did climate change start to get worse? We see the early Dan Garren Road border in Edward, Mount Hill South and dig with our set. Who discovered that the climate was changing and how? Well, thank you, Noah and Layla, for those wonderful questions and also thank you to Layla for asking the question in Welsh and then translating her question from Welsh into English because my Welsh certainly isn't what it should be. Um, so the first question I think to, to Emily is, is when did we and indeed when did you first become aware that there is a problem with the climate? Yeah, thank you, Brian. So, so Noah asked this really good question of where did it all begin? And it really all began with the Industrial Revolution. That's the time when, when we all started using machines to help us uh, go about our daily lives. And those machines are all powered by what we call fossil fuels. That's coal or oil or gas. And when you burn fossil fuels, you produce carbon dioxide. So when we started using those machines about 200 years ago or so to help us with our lives, we started putting more carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. And actually about the same time, scientists started to understand that uh, if you put more carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, you would warm the world. 
And uh, over the course of the past 200 years, our understanding of that has increased. And the first time that scientists got together and really raised the alarm bells around climate change was in 1990, so just over 30 years ago. And that was when uh, the world was alerted to the dangers of climate change. Thanks, Emily. It does, it does seem like, um, to me, not so long ago. I mean, 30 years, it seems like yesterday to me. Um, Mark, um, when do you, uh, or what do you remember of becoming aware that there is a, a climate emergency, that there is a problem with the climate? Thanks, Brian. And again, there's some great questions. I suppose when I was a teenager at school, uh, especially learning chemistry and so on, I learned about things like the sulfur cycle and the, the different, uh, the nitrogen cycle. So in other words, I, I had an awareness that, that, that chemicals can affect our environment. Uh, but it was actually, in fact, when I was at, at university um, studying uh, the atmosphere that we uh, I then understood about uh, the how carbon dioxide in particular uh, can affect uh, the temperature, the temperature of the of the earth and how that in turn can influence climate. So again, that was probably um, around 20, 20 years or so ago, uh, which may seem a long time for some, uh, but in the in the con, you know, within a human lifetime, it's certainly uh, relatively short. And especially if we look in, in terms of how long the, the planet has been around, it's really a short time scale. So that's why there is a sense of urgency to try and address these issues. And Lindsay, what were the, the first signs uh, that you're aware of, 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 of an impact in terms of climate? Well, Brian, so I'm 50 years old, and that's half a century. That's how long I've lived, and I was born in 1970. And when I was just a young child, I was about six, we moved from Scotland to Manchester. And, and that year, 1976, was incredibly hot. And in fact, it's one of the hottest and driest summers that we've ever seen in Britain. And I thought, wow, I've hit the jackpot moving here. Manchester is a really hot and sunny place. It turned out I was wrong about that. But what's happened over my lifetime is those slightly freakish summers have got more and more common. And certainly through the 1990s, so that's, you know, maybe only 20 or 30 years ago, uh, those summers became more and more of a common thing. And so that's something I've really noticed. So very hot, dry summers being incredibly rare to becoming really quite common. You know, the lawn used to be soggy for sort of 10 months of the year. And it's only in July and August, maybe, when you could walk on it without it squelching under your feet. And now that just doesn't happen. It's brown and dry. So it's not just that the climate's changed, but we can see this impact on the animals and plants that are living in our environments, in our gardens and around us. And, and definitely in my lifetime, I've really seen those things change really quite alarmingly quickly. Now, we've had some great questions around the science of climate change. And this theme is going to be introduced by two questions, one from Rhiannon and one from Sophie. My name is Brianna and I'm from Single World Primary School and my question is, how is the blanket around our world actually made? Hello, I'm Sophie from Wellfield Middle School. My, this is a question for Brian Cox. What's the difference between climate change and global warming? Well, thanks both. Those are both excellent questions. Um, I'm not going to answer your question directly, Sophie. I'm going to pass it on to the experts. That's one of the things that I've learned in science. I'm going to ask the, the people who know. Um, and uh, so I think, uh, Mark, the, that, that first question from Rhiannon uh, about the blanket, beautifully put, the blanket around our planet. What is that and what is it made of? Well, firstly, that's a great question. Uh, the blanket is, it contains, it's a delicate balance of certain gases, certain chemicals in, in the atmosphere that, that perform key roles uh, that help us. So for example, uh, you may have some ozone and ozone will protect, protect us from harmful UV rays. And so we need ozone, but, but more in terms of climate change, the blanket is consisting of mainly carbon dioxide, but also other gases, gases that absorb energy 
And then as a result, they start to warm the atmosphere. And so there are a number of different types of these types of gases. Uh, one of the most important ones is carbon dioxide and also water vapor um, can also play a role in this whole uh, climate change process. And a blanket is a really nice word, isn't it? It sounds like a really good thing. And I suppose it is a good thing in a sense. I know that the earth, you'll know better than me, but it'd be, it'd be freezing cold without them, wouldn't it? Absolutely. Um, I think the blanket is a perfect uh, term for, for what we're really talking about. But just like uh, a blanket at home, we want to make sure it's, it's clean and we want to make sure that it keeps us safe as well as keeping us uh, warm and protected. Um, and that's, that's a really good analogy uh, for, for what we're, we're talking about here. Emily, would, would you like to can talk? I, can I have a go at answering Sophie's question? Yeah. Sophie asked this really good question about what's the difference between global warming and climate change. And what we've been seeing is the world has been warming up. We have had global warming. We're about one degree Celsius warmer today than we were 150 years ago. But along with that warming, we've also been seeing many other changes to the climate. So we've been seeing climate change as well as global warming. And those changes are things like um, the uh, rise of the seas as uh, so sea level has risen as the ice has been melting and as the water in the oceans have been warming up. We've been seeing more extreme weather around the world. So we've been seeing floods or droughts or wildfires. And it's that collection of changes to the climate, as well as the warming, which is causing all the problems uh, that we see associated with, with, with that climate change. Thanks, Emily. And thanks to Rhiannon and Sophie for those great questions. We had loads of questions on this subject. And, and one of them that kept coming up was about the COVID-19 pandemic that we're all still living through at the moment and whether that has had any impact on climate change. So, uh, Lindsay, do, do we see or do we know yet whether the pandemic has had any impact? Well, my understanding about the impact of COVID-19, this pandemic that we've all had to experience, the way that has in, interacted with climate change is that it's probably still a bit early to tell um, and that we need to wait and, and, and find out a bit. But there is some evidence emerging of some worrying signs. So climate change is caused by, as Emily said, a lot of it is because of the burning of fossil fuels that puts this gas carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. But it's also made worse by things like chopping down trees. And you may well know that lots of forests are being destroyed to make way for land so that we can grow the crops that we need to eat. And the rate of that happening, in other words, how many trees are being chopped down, there is some evidence that during this COVID-19 pandemic, there's been more of that happening. Emily, do you have any thoughts on this? Yeah, so... Last year, when so much um, was stopped, we were all, all you children were at home doing homeschooling and people weren't traveling to work or certainly weren't traveling for holidays. Um, our emissions of carbon dioxide went down a little bit. Um, and, uh, and that's a good thing because it means that they were contributing, we were contributing less to climate change. But the amount by which they went down was quite small. So if we want to really uh, stop the worst impacts of climate change, then over the next couple of decades, we need to completely stop our emissions of carbon dioxide. And to give you a sense of how much they reduced last year, when every, you know, we all stopped all our, all, all our activities, um, my house, uh, if I want to go from my bedroom in the morning down to my kitchen, I have to walk down 16 steps. And the amount of, uh, and so eventually, if we think of that as being the amount we have to reduce our emissions of carbon dioxide, the amount that our emissions reduced last year were equivalent to going down just one of those 16 steps. But what's happened this year is that everything is restarted again, and it's likely that we've gone most of the way back up again. Um, so that's how much, you know, the change that we really, the big changes to our lifestyles that we made last year were only a small part of the changes that we need to make if we're to address climate change. 
Well, this brings us really neatly on to the next topic, actually, because we had loads of questions on, on pollution, plastics, and as we've been discussing, carbon dioxide, CO2. Well, now let's hear from Liz on this topic. If we continue polluting the earth and making temperatures rise, how long do we have until all the icebergs in the world melt? Well, thanks, Liz. It's a question that I think many people ask when they look at the, the polar regions and hear that the polar ice is melting. So, um, Emily, uh, what do we know about the question Liz asked? Um, how long have we got until all the icebergs melt? So thanks, Liz. That's a really great, uh, great question. Um, so there's two different types of ice that we need to worry about. The first is what we call sea ice. That's when the sea literally freezes. And in the polar regions, that happens each year. What we're seeing is that that, I, that sea ice is melting really significantly at the moment. So in the Arctic Ocean, over the last 30 years or so, the amount of sea ice in the Arctic has decreased really dramatically. It, it always melts each summer, um, but not all the way. And the amount of ice at the end of the summer melt season today is just half of what it was about 30 years ago. And if we continue to warm the world in the way we are at the moment, um, then it may be gone entirely at the end of each summer um, in just the next couple of decades. The other ice that you have in the polar region sits on the land and forms um, the ice sheets. And then as it goes into the sea, the ice shelves. And that ice is also melting. And that ice is melting two ways. First of all, it's melting on top because the warmer air on top is melting it. But also what's happening is that as the oceans are warming up, that warmer ocean water is getting underneath those ice sheets and melting them from below. So they're getting double attacked by the warming. That process happens quite slowly. So it's not something that uh, is going to, those ice sheets going to completely disappear over the next uh, few years. But what we're really concerned about is that the processes that are starting the destruction of those ice sheets are happening now. And when those, that ice that sat on land eventually collapses and melts, it gets into the water of the oceans and that's um, significantly rising the sea levels. Lindsay, it sounds very complicated. There's, there's the, the sea ice and the ice on the land and the sea temperatures and the land temperatures and the air temperatures. Um, and then a question that just keeps coming up, which is that, is there a simple solution to this complicated problem, which might be just plant more trees and we'll be okay? Yes, well, I think you're absolutely right. It's very complicated and very complicated things don't generally have very simple solutions. And I think the truth is there isn't a single simple solution. And in fact, lots of scientists keep saying that, that we need to do lots of different things all at the same time, because this is a very big problem. But planting trees is one of the things that we can do. So we have cut down a lot of trees all around the world, Britain, uh, for example, here in the UK, we would have had a lot more trees than we do now. And so there are a lot of plans now to plant a lot more trees and that will help. So as trees grow, they draw carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. And remember, it's the fact that there's too much carbon dioxide in the atmosphere that's one of the main causes of global warming. So as trees grow, they will lock it up and they will lock it up in their trunks and in the wood. And so that will take, you know, over the next one or 200 years, if we plant a lot of trees now, then we will be able to suck quite a lot of carbon dioxide out of our atmosphere. But it's not the only thing we have to do. We also have to concentrate on not continuing to put carbon dioxide into the atmosphere in the first place. And I think perhaps Mark can say something about that. Yes, I'm, I'm happy to comment on that. Uh, as Lindsay said, the, the, the other side of, of the coin, if you like, is that we could also do a lot to reduce our energy consumption or at least be more efficient with the energy that we're producing. Uh, because it's through producing a lot of, uh, or at least using a lot of energy, that this CO2 is created. If we were to ask why are we burning so much fossil fuels, 
This is often to fuel things like power stations and so on, to create electricity, which we use for all sorts of things, including probably your games consoles and other things as well. So we've got to think uh, more broadly about how we can, what we can do, we can do our bit individually, if you like, to reduce the amount of energy that we consume. And I think that along with planting more trees uh, and other solutions will help to get us closer to a, a, a solving this, this uh, world issue. So, so it's a balance, Emily, I think is what, what we're hearing, that we have to put less carbon dioxide into the atmosphere and take more out at the same time it would be the ideal thing to do. Yes, Brian, you're absolutely right. And the way that I like to think about this is that it's like a bath. And on the one hand, you have the tap in the bath uh, that could be putting more water into the bath. And the other, you have the plug uh, where water can be coming out of uh, out of it. And so what we need to do is make sure that uh, the amount of uh, carbon dioxide that we're taking out of the atmosphere, whether that's through planting trees or, or other methods, um, is, is as much as we're putting in from the tap. Now our next theme is on the impacts of climate change on, on various animal and plant species. So we had lots of questions about polar bears and koalas, deer, and um, lots of things that you were concerned about. Well, lots of wonderful questions there. And to get us going, we're going to hear two questions from Lacey and Poppy. How much of the Earth's surface will become uninhabitable if nothing changes? My question is, if climate change was to continue to happen, what would happen to the environment and biodiversity? Well, thanks, Lacey and Poppy. And I think we'll start with Lacey's question, which was um, it's quite... Um, quite a worrying question actually that must bother many of us which is if climate change continues and we don't do anything about it is it possible that the, the whole earth will become uninhabitable and um, I'll ask that question to Lindsay. Well thanks Brian so I've brought along a little prop to help us think about what might happen to all the animals and plants on the earth as it starts to get warmer. This is my prop and it's an orange right and this orange is going to represent our earth and this line that I've drawn around the middle is what we call the equator. And that's where it's generally hottest. So we get the most sun on the equator. And as we move away towards the poles, either the North Pole, which is the top of my orange, or down towards the South Pole, which is the bottom of my orange, and it generally gets colder. Now, what would happen if I start to warm the whole thing up? Now, well, what you can imagine is that a big thing that animals and plants can do as the orange gets warmer is they can move. So things will move away from the equator generally as it got hotter, they'd be able to move north or they'd be able to move south. Now you might think, well, that's all very straightforward then, but what will happen to some of the animals who are already living right at the top? And there's not really anywhere for them to go. So things living at the poles are at most danger of being squeezed off the planet entirely. So for them, the planet may become uninhabitable because there just isn't anywhere left for them to go. So in fact, the warming that we see is much greater at the poles than it is around the equator. So that's one complication. And another problem for animals and plants is they can't always move. And that's partly because we have put barriers in the way. So animals trying to move north, for example, might run into roads or they might run into cities. So that's why it's quite difficult for us to know exactly what's going to happen to all the different plants and animals. Now, on average, people reckon, scientists reckon, that of all the species that are currently threatened on Earth, and we do have lists of them, that about one in five of those species, the threats to it are caused by climate change. So it is a big, it's going to have a big impact on lots of different plants and animals. Thanks, Lindsay. So, so Emily, it seems that um, we're not talking, as, as Lacey suggested, about perhaps everything being wiped off the surface of the Earth, or the, the Earth turning into a planet like Venus with no life at all. But as Poppy said, uh, what we're talking about here is the impact on that, that big word but that everybody hears about, which is biodiversity. That's right, Brian. And, and there are a lot of different ways in which 
biodiversity, the, the animals and plants, nature is impacted by climate change. Lindsay's mentioned how we're seeing species moving closer towards the poles so that they stay um, in, the, in the temperatures that, they, that they're used to. We're also seeing in the same way um, animals moving further up mountains so they stay in those cooler um, temperatures. Another change that we're seeing is um, impacts on hibernating animals. So animals that want to sleep over the winter in the cooler temperatures, if the temperatures aren't reaching low enough, then uh, they don't know that they're supposed to be going to sleep. So some of the animals that we are used to see, are used to hibernating, dormice, for example, um, are starting to suffer as well. So there are many different impacts on, on nature of climate change. But the other concern is about people and we're already seeing the impacts on people, for example, in terms of extreme heat waves and particularly elderly people, uh, extreme heat waves can really cause problems for their health. And in some instances, um, people have been dying as a consequence of the extreme heat. And Lindsay, you mentioned a number which was about a fifth of all species have been impacted by climate change. Does that mean that we might lose a fifth of all species on the planet due to climate change? Well, I think we, first of all, we have to recognise it's just that they're, they're under threat from climate change. It's not inevitable that they're going to go extinct. These things should be sending a strong warning to us all that we really need to act. Another thing I brought along to show everybody is this. Now, this is a piece of coral. As you can see, it's bright white. And coral is one of the species that's very, very sensitive to changes in water temperature. So there are some quite dire predictions about coral reefs. And that's also one of the things that I find quite shocking. So when I was a child, I remember reading about the Great Barrier Reef off Australia. And people used to say it was one of the natural things that you could see from space, which seemed incredibly impressive. And just in the last 10 years, the Great Barrier Reef has started to have what's called coral bleaching. And that's when coral gets too warm and the water gets too warm. This is just the skeleton of the coral left that's white. And if the coral animal dies, you're just left with these white skeletons. And great areas of the Great Barrier Reef have started to turn into just these white bleach skeletons. And I think that's the kind of alarm bell that should really make us all sit up and say, not in our lifetimes. We're not going to let this happen. We can change our impact on the planet and make sure that children growing up can still see corals in the future. And we had a lot of questions um, about not only the, as you said, the barrier reef of Australia or the polar regions, and we think about polar bears and coral, but a lot of people asked a question, which I think is a good question, which is, what can we do uh, closer to home? If you want to help the birds in your garden or the insects in your garden, what can we do now? Let your garden get a bit wilder. And so that's a big thing in the UK now, people are talking about rewilding, which is a really exciting thing. And that's about instead of fighting nature back all the time and cutting your lawn as short as possible and removing all the weeds, why not let it grow a bit longer, or at least some of it? Why not let some of the weeds, which are actually, they're just wild plants. Uh, and some of those wild plants are really important for bees, for example. So, so you can tell your mum your, your and dad are, your grandparents don't make me go out and pull all the weeds up because weeds <laughs> weeds are plants. <laughs> a absolutely. A weed is just a wild plant. A weed is not a proper scientific term. A weed is just a plant growing where you don't want it to grow. And if we just broaden our minds and, and, and think actually weeds are just wild plants that support bees and support other insects, let's let them grow in our gardens. Yes, that's the excuse to give your mum when she wants you to go gardening. So there you go, everybody. You can say, Dr. Turnbull said, <laughs> I should not be weeding the garden. <laughs> um, Mark, I should, uh, I, I, sh I know you're not, you're not in this section of my notes, but. Um... Sure. I, I think both uh, Lindsay and Emily have done a great job of, of showing how, what the impact of climate can, change can be in both the poles and the, and the, the equator. And, and for example, my family, they come from the Caribbean, uh, which is more in the tropical region and a big concern for many of the islands in the Caribbean is the rising sea surface, the sea temperatures 
uh, and rising sea levels, I should say, um, which can impact both uh, the actual, because many of them are islands, so that could also impact the habitable land as well as the local um, tropical wildlife, which is very rich uh, in biodiversity. So I think it's, it's a global issue um, which, which can affect different parts of the world in different ways, from the poles to the equator and um, pretty much most places in between. Thanks, and that brings us very neatly, actually, onto the, the wider global impacts of mm -hmm. climate change. We had lots of questions about uh, the glaciers melting, weather, flooding, the, the, the impacts, as Mark said, on islands, food shortages, etc. Now let's hear from Jack and Euphraj to start the conversation. My name is Jack Potter and I'm from Copley Academy. My question to you is what will happen to planet Earth when all of the glaciers finally melt? Hello, I'm Euphraj and my question is, if the seas are rising, would parts of the UK eventually disappear? Now, Emily, um, we heard from Jack there the, the, the question that I think um, a lot of people are really concerned about, which is, uh, we hear that the ice caps are melting, the ice is melting, we've already talked about that. Um, so what will happen to our planet if that happens, if all the ice melts? Yeah, thanks Jack for that, for that great question. So if ice is sat on land in glaciers or in the ice sheets in the polar regions and it melts, then it finds that melted water finds its way into the seas and the seas are starting to rise. In fact, they've already risen by about 25 centimeters, so about that much, which doesn't sound very much, but it's meaning that those people who live by the sea um, in, in towns or cities on the coast uh, are at greater risk of flooding. And some places, which are small islands that are very low, they, they, they're very close to the, the sea, all the communities, uh, are at risk of going completely underwater. And, and Lindsay, um, you, French, asked the question specifically about, about the UK. So in the UK, are there any areas, as, as Emily said, that are on the coast now, but they're particularly vulnerable? Um, yes, I think, unfortunately, the UK will not be immune to changes in sea level. Parts of the east coast of Britain are very low lying. And what we tend to have done in the past is just build great big barriers against the sea, what are called hard flood defences and hard coastal defences. Well, there is a change in mindset now and saying actually perhaps perhaps that's not the right thing to do and perhaps what we need to do is kind of retreat from the coast let humans come back from the coast and allow the coastline to become a bit wilder to allow the salt marshes to come back uh, and they are really good actually at absorbing a lot of wave energy and and holding back the sea so these are the kinds of changes that we see around britain now with people changing the way they think about how we're going to cope with these rising sea levels going forward. Um, Mark, um, could you explain uh, how it is or why it is that climate change can cause more episodes of extreme weather? Well, I think the, the key issue is that we started with, with more CO2 in the atmosphere, which leads to warming which leads to potentially ice melting, which leads to increased sea levels, but then uh, more moisture, more water in the atmosphere uh, can, can cause, as I've said, more rain, rainfall, uh, which could lead to more flooding. And also wind is, is driven by, by heat. There's a heat process. So these changes in heat also causes changes uh, in, in, in the atmosphere and the pressures of the atmosphere and this is what determines uh, things like humidity and all of these different balances uh, will cause uh, further impacts on on climate so I, I suppose if we want to get back to 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 the root it's not an easy question as though uh, one thing leads directly to another but there are so many different balances between the components that it increases the likelihood of many of the the, the more sort of um, extreme weather conditions, uh, which we, 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 have been, we are aware of, and in some parts of the world uh, have been experiencing. 
So it all sounds quite worrying, doesn't it? We've discussed sea level rise and flooding, extreme weather, potential extinctions. Uh, but the last set of questions you've asked are much more optimistic. They're, they're about what you, what we, and what governments can do about climate change. And now let's hear from Samaya, Grace, and from the pupils in year five at St. Peter's. Hello, my name is Samaya Aslam. I'm from Lower Floyd Primary School. Um, so here's my question. How can we make a world a better place for us when we grow up? What is the one thing that would make the biggest difference to help to stop climate change that we should all start doing now? Can you reverse global warming? Well, Mark, we heard a question from Grace there, which was a short question, absolutely to the point, which is, can we reverse global warming? Well, I, I can give an equally short answer. And I believe certainly, yes, we can reverse it. Uh, but I will try and back that up with a little bit of evidence from the past. And uh, when I was doing some research in the early days, a lot of the focus was on the ozone hole. So I mentioned very early on about an ozone layer and how it protects us as part of this, this blanket. But there was a hole in the ozone layer caused by, by human activity. And as a result, once this was known, uh, the governments from around the world and people from around the world changed their habits and stopped releasing these harm harmful chemicals that were um, destroying the ozone layer. And now, 20 or more years later, um, we are quite pleased to report that the ozone hole, the ozone layer, I should say, is quite healthy. Um, and I believe it is just about closed, closed back up again in the Antarctic. So that is a clear example of when we work together, for the, for the right cause, uh, then we can uh, solve most issues. And I think that's the power of human endeavor. Uh, Emily, Samaya asked what I thought was a, a magnificent question. I mean, it's, it's a question that I think we should all ask ourselves all the time, which is how can we make the world a better place for us when we grow up? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. And, and year five at St. Peter's also asked the question, you know, what single thing could we could we be doing? And I think the answer is there isn't a single thing. I'm going to give you three things that, that we could be doing um, and what and three things that you uh, young people could be doing. Um, so number one thing is uh, change the way we live our lives. And that doesn't mean change it in a really big way. It means doing things like eating a bit less meat. So one less beef burger a week um, would make quite a big difference. Eat more fruit and vegetables instead. Uh, we could walk and cycle a bit more than driving in the car. That would also make a, a difference. And in winter, stick on a, a sweater um, uh, so we don't need to turn the heating up as much. So that's the first thing, live life a little bit differently. The second thing that we can do is use our voices. We can uh, tell our parents and carers, we can tell our school, um, we can write to our prime minister and say, we want climate change to be taken seriously. We want action on climate change. And the third thing that we can do is we can help be part of the sort of create the solutions of the future. And that means um, uh, studying at school, studying science. And there's lots and lots of really exciting science that you can that you can study. And then um, in time, you can help uh, invent some of the solutions. You can invent ways of reversing climate change by taking uh, carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. So those are the three great things. Live life differently. Um, use your voice and then help create the solutions of the future. And in fact, actually, maybe even some of the young people listening today will be the leaders of the future that will help lead us into a, a greener, cleaner world in the future. Well, yes, Lindsay, actually, some of Emily's solutions, which, uh, you know, live a healthier life, uh, go and walk a bit more, go on a bike a bit more, eat more fruits and vegetables, are actually things that, that should be enjoyable <laughs> for themselves in their own way. Uh, as well as being extremely helpful. Yes, I think that's absolutely right. And, and we mustn't get mired in doom because there's no point to that anyway. Uh, it's always good to be hopeful and optimistic because otherwise you, if you don't believe you can make something better, then why would you even try to? 
And I think there's certainly plenty of evidence that even if we can't completely rewind the damage that's been done, can we create a bright, sustainable future, a world that will still contain vast numbers of plants and animals that we can all enjoy? Yes, of course we can do that. One of the biggest changes I've seen in terms of the global warming in my lifetime has been the impact of children. When the children started the school climate strike, suddenly politicians went into an, an extra gear and they really do listen to you and they have listened to you. So you've already achieved a lot more than, than, than many of us have managed to achieve. So please don't give up. We absolutely need you. You are our future. Yes, actually, some of the questions um, addressed to me were, what would I do if I was prime minister? And it's very nice of you to suggest that I might be prime minister. And, and I, I was going to say exactly what Lindsay had said which is I would listen to you, uh, partly because uh, it is your world. And as one of my great heroes, Carl Sagan, used to say, um, what we adults are doing is we're custodians of the world and we're passing it on to you. And so we should pass it on in a good state. But secondly, I'd listen to you because you know what you're talking about, which I can see from the questions that you've asked. Um, I wanted to ask Mark, actually, um, for, for your your opinion we're getting towards the end now so on this question of what we can all do to help make this situation better well I, I completely agree with all that's been said before of things that we can do practically um, I suppose um, if there was one thing it would be effectively and many of you are doing it already is to shift the mindset shift the way how we view the world and the environment. If you actually think about uh, the fact that the environment is, is, is our home collectively as people on this planet and animals and plants and, and everything else, and just thinking in terms in those, those terms, it, might, it will make you think about things like energy usage um, and, and biodiversity and all the things we've been talking about. So I, and the, other, the second thing I suppose is, is to be inquisitive, which you'll, you've obviously been doing already. Ask the questions and also be prepared to do some of the investigating yourself, because not only will it help you get further along the way to understanding uh, the, the challenges with, with climate change, it would also, uh, that, that's also a good sign of a budding scientist. And we certainly need uh, more of those uh, in the future to help solve uh, many of the, the issues uh, that, we, that the world has. We, we ourselves couldn't solve them. We have to rely on uh, the, the, your generation really to solve some of the problems we're talking about today. So in that sense, I think it's, it's quite an exciting time to be a scientist um, because science is about solving problems and there are plenty of issues that, that, we, that you can get involved in uh, over time. Um, so with that, I thought I'd give the last word to our magnificent panel to, to summarize what we've learned and maybe um, have a final thought on this, on this vitally important issue. Maybe I'll go to uh, Mark. I think it's a great debate that we've had, a fascinating set of questions. And the thing that I'd probably, uh, final thoughts from myself, is really that hopefully the one thing you should appreciate, that the climate issues are not short term, they are over many, many years. So therefore, whatever you're doing now, try and keep that same uh, energy and, uh, and enthusiasm for wanting to solve this, this issue and wanting to understand it uh, throughout, throughout your lives really, because the environment belongs to all of us and we all have some level of responsibility to keep it healthy and, and in that way it will help to protect us. Lindsay. Yes, well, I think you've given me a lot of hope, all of you children out there today, just from the sheer number of you that have joined this programme, that have sent in your questions. And I want to thank you for that, because we also need hope, us oldies, as I approach my half century, as I just said. It's great to know that there's so many of you out there who do care. And I, I definitely feel that, that the future is in safe hands, frankly. Um, and yeah, do keep asking questions, do keep uh, engaged. And of course, if you also don't want to be a scientist, if Brian can't hear me, that's also fine. We love people to become scientists, but actually whatever you choose to become, you can get involved with the future of this planet because it's not just scientists who we need. We need all kinds of people and all kinds of talent. 
So I really hope that you've all been inspired to become climate champions, because if we all work together, then we can change the world instead of changing the climate.